It's time for the Talent Talk Radio Show, brought to you by People G2, a nationwide leader in background checks and employment screening solutions. People G2 gives their clients access to the best human capital management and due diligence tools available. They are dedicated to helping their clients with all of their people-related decisions. To learn more, go to www.peopleg2.com. Talent Talk centers on the topics of talent recruitment and management, leadership development, company culture, and employee engagement. These are all timely topics for CEOs, entrepreneurs, HR professionals, and business leaders. We hope that as you tune in to listen each week, whether to the live broadcast or to the podcast on iTunes or iHeartRadio, that you hear something you can take away that will help you grow and impact your career in a positive way. And now, here's the host of the Talent Talk Radio Show, the founder and CEO of People G2, Chris Dyer. Hey everyone, welcome to Talent Talk. It's Tuesday, which means we are here with two fantastic guests to learn, to talk, to ask questions, and to hopefully learn something that we can use in our own career uh, in, a, in a positive way. So. Now, this is really what the show is all about, having these remarkable leaders here, uh, talking to these very talented people about how they manage talent, what they've been seeing out there, what books are they reading, what are they thinking about, worried about, you know, anything that we can we can use. And so many of their stories over the years have actually been big parts of, of the books that I've written uh, and the work that I do uh, with companies as a consultant and, of course, in my own companies that I run. So uh, if you're interested in and any of that, you can check out my first book, a bestseller called The Power of Company Culture. And then my recent book that just came out this year, also hit the bestseller list, Remote Work. Uh, you know, go to Amazon or wherever you find books. I'm sure you'll have no trouble finding it uh, if you found this radio show. So um, as I mentioned, Teletalk is live every Tuesday, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. We love our live audience. They come in, they follow us on Twitter at PeopleG2 and ask questions and comment and uh, really are part of the conversation. But if you're not coming in live, that's okay. You can still uh, connect with us on Twitter. And you can also make sure you subscribe wherever you're listening to this show. If it's iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify, whatever, just subscribe that way. You make sure you always get uh, the next episode and find out what the next amazing leader is thinking about and talking about. All right, speaking of my guest today, uh, we will first bring in uh, Mark Hirschberg. He's the MIT instructor author and CTO. And then this is sort of our, our very technical group today. And then we're going to have in uh, Steve Orr, and he's a federal CTO at Intel. So uh, hopefully we won't get too technical for everybody. I think these guys are pretty ad adept at being able to, uh, I don't want to say dumb it down for us, but let's not take us too too technical. So but let's go ahead and bring in Mark Hirschberg. Uh, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I know you're an MIT instructor, you're a CTO, you're an author as well uh, of the career toolbook, Essential Skills for Success that No One Taught You. Uh, why don't you tell everyone a little bit of what else is important for us to know about you so we can have a great conversation today? My primary career is building typically startup companies, whether classic startups or helping Fortune 500s who want to innovate. But what I realized early in my career were that there were these other non-technical skills I needed to succeed. Yes, I knew how to program, I was pretty good at, but to be the leader I wanted to become, I had to learn leadership skills, communication, negotiation, networking. And so I've had this side career where I've been teaching now for 20 years at MIT and elsewhere, trying to help develop these professional skills in our workforce, because unfortunately, it's not normally taught at the high school or college level. You know, in, in sort of preparing for our conversation today, I was suddenly remembered an old lesson that I received. I took like an extra uh, sort of networking course when I was in, in, in um, actually it was after I graduated, I went back into some little like, extra courses. I did one on like, you know, Windows NT or something, right? And I'm sure whatever I learned in that, I probably couldn't help me in today's uh, technology. But I do remember my professor saying over and over and over again, whenever something wouldn't work or we couldn't figure out how to do something, he always said, always check permissions. And it was a, always, he was always right when it came to the problem with the technical side of it, right? There was always something not turned on, something with permissions wasn't, wasn't correct, right? That was a, sort of stopping me. But over the years, I evolved that advice into the human side of it. 
when I wasn't getting the reaction from people or the, the buy-in from people or the, you know, the expect, what I expected from them on behavior, I always remember, go back and check permissions. Like, do I have the permission to that with them to move forward? Do they have the permission to even say yes to me or no to me? Like, you know, there's so much about that that sort of is a, it's a soft skill, right? Um, and, and I don't know if, if, if you've, you've sort of seen that as well. Absolutely. Certainly we know when negotiating, are you the person I should negotiate with or is it your boss or someone else in the company? Am I wasting my time if you're not that right person? Or maybe you're the gatekeeper I have to get through. When it comes to networking, a common mistake is, oh, hey, Chris, I want to meet you. Nice to meet you. Can you do me this favor? Can you get me this job? Whoa, slow down. We just met. Right. Do we have that permission, that relationship that you're willing to open a door for me? Right. Even going to your earlier comment about communication, about Steve and I, not dumbing down, but how do we translate what's in our language, vocabulary, our mental models to people who don't have that? And how do all of us, no matter what our background is, we all carry a certain background and context. How do we make sure we can communicate in the context of our audience? These are all important skills that we never talk about in school. Yeah, and, and I think you've, you've landed on one of the big, maybe big two or three concepts that I think makes a great leader. They have to be able to communicate effectively and foster good communication as well amongst their organization. It's not just enough for them to do it really well if everyone else is doing it terribly, right? Uh, how, how else would you define good leadership? Leadership is diverse, and we could have two people come up with completely different lists. In the book, I really focus on the fundamentals of leadership because so many people, particularly early in their career, although early can be even throughout their 20s, 30s, sometimes in their 40s, think of leadership positionally coming from you have a title and not true influential leadership, which is what companies always want. They want people to stand up and take initiative. Now, of course, we can say, well, a leader is someone who can put forth an idea and have other people follow. But to be effective, as you're asking, there's a myriad of skills, which includes communication, includes having a strong network, knowing how to negotiate, knowing how to even manage people can help make you an effective leader, even though we typically distinguish management from leadership. So all of these skills can help support you to be more effective in your leadership. And the great thing is for developing leaders, you don't have to wait till you are standing out front as a leader to work on these skills. You can develop them even when you're not a leader. So when you do step forward, you have the skills at the ready. Yeah, and one of the, I think one of the things I've learned over the years is that uh, to be a good leader, often uh, the, sort of the more I learn about how to be a good leader and the more I'm able to put things in practice, kind of the harder it is to do. And, and, and what I mean by that is I have found that ultimately if, if I do it right, if I get everything right about leadership, then my, my team, the people that I'm most uh, often interacting with, should feel like I didn't have anything to do with it. Like that they were able to be successful, get their job done, you know, reach the goal, whatever. And, I, and that I wasn't some part of that. I mean, I was, if they really think about it, right? I'm, I'm, I'm there creating the environment, the periphery, but I'm not in there doing the work, right? I'm not standing there doing the thing with them or making that thing happen right alongside them. They're able to do that themselves. Uh, and I don't know how much of that translates into what you're talking about with the, because there is influential versus positional leadership. You know, it, it, is that the high level in your opinion that you can really you know, empower people to do their best work without you being a bottleneck, I guess, in, in that process. You've hit on two important points here. The first, as you noted, the more you learn, you feel it becomes even more complex. And that's because when we start out as leaders or really with any of these skills, we have this very narrow view. Well, a leader just tells people what to do. Okay, that's easy. I'm going to tell others what to do. Then you start to realize, well, no, it's not ordering other people around. It's influencing them, it's supporting them, it's helping, it's mentoring, it's guiding, it's planning. Okay, there's a lot more to do. And so we start to say, oh, there's a whole bunch of things I have to focus on. It gets more complex. And that's why we as leaders always need to continue to learn and evolve. Now then to your second point, what the best leaders know is leadership is not zero sum. If I am the leader in charge of the company, I don't say, well, Chris, you, you shouldn't be leading. That's my job. It's like, Chris, I want you to stand up and lead and stand next to me. At times, even stand in front of me 
Mm -hmm. because we together can do more. You are not eclipsing or limiting my leadership and good leaders know how to elevate and support other people. In my book, one of the things I teach, I put this in the management section, a good manager is a lazy manager. What do we mean? When I manage teams, every time I have to make a decision, that means I had to be there and I couldn't be doing something else. If I can empower my team to make that decision, either by giving them the authority or having a process in place to guide that decision, now I don't have to do that and I can use my time and energy to do something else that adds yet more value to the company. And so all of us as leaders and managers want to empower and help our teams and organizations and systems to really do as much as possible without us. So if someone out there listening maybe is just starting their leadership journey or feeling like maybe their leadership journey has hit a, a bit of a, a bump in the road. Uh, is there maybe a one or two qualities you think they should really focus in on to, to kind of jumpstart that process? I would not say there's just one or two. And here's one of the challenges I often see in HR. HR says we want leaders for when we're hiring, we want someone who is a leader. That can mean many things. The leader who says I am going to grow this team or this business from a small size to medium to large, that's a different type of leadership than so you bring someone in when you have a demoralized team and say you have to reinvigorate them, or a leader who inspires, or a leader who transforms, or a leader who can bring together warring factions. They're all important types of leadership, but they are different, and any leader may not be equally strong at each of them. So it's important to say, what do we mean when we want someone to be a leader or when you want to develop as a leader, in what way? And it might be all of them, but you're not going to do all of it at once. So what do you want? It's like you want a basketball player. Well, someone who's a good shooter, a good defender, a good passer. What do you want? And focus on those particular skills, then move on to others. Yeah, and then that's, filling, I guess, filling in the gaps, right? It, if organizations can really figure out what they need. And I, I've seen very few be good at that. Um, there are some. But to really understand, geez, we have a lot of extroverted inspiring leaders and yet we probably need some introverted like really run the team get things done you know doesn't need the, the center of attention but it can be really results oriented right and that's leadership too i think we make that big mistake that leadership is always some hollywood version right of a person who's just loud mouth and and overly inspiring and just you know i don't know like you're the best coach you ever had in sports or something because a lot of my best leaders are quiet. They listen a lot. Uh, they, they, they really understand what's happening in their organization and they can get things moving quickly, right? Without being a loud mouth. Now there's anything wrong with extroverts. I am one. Uh, but you know, that's not the only leadership style, right? <laughs> this is, this is a very important point, And I address it in the section, the myth of the alpha male, because we do have this Hollywood view. Think 1950s leading man stands right. up, takes charge. And from just our cultural norms, this is what we're brought up seeing as a leader. And this is what many people look for as a leader. And what happens is companies, because we have this bias within us, we look for that extrovert. We look for that loud, decisive person. And we miss out on other, at times even better leaders who have a different leadership style. So it's very important, even if you do not want to be a leader, to understand leadership to understand the different styles and recognize what is leadership and what do you look for so you don't follow the wrong leader. Yeah, and, and I think once you, I guess once you have figured that out, if you have your good leadership in, in there, and to your point, you said maybe you don't want to be the leader. I mean, I know lots of people that say, it's not what I want to do. I'm, I'm really good at what I do, but I don't necessarily need to go and lead a team as well. Um, I can go and be the best salesperson or the best IT person, whatever, but I don't want to be in charge of everybody. So what, what's sort of that, I guess, relationship then between, you know, leading and, and, and following? One of the things that is very important to understand is that leadership and management skills, in fact, all the skills in the book, negotiating, networking, communicating, these are not skills that belong to a title. These are skills that we all use every day. Because even if you don't directly manage people, well, all of us do manage people, not maybe in the hierarchy, but you and I have to work together on some project, maybe with other people. 
how do I convince you to do this part that I'm not as good at? Or how do we trade off? We have to maybe negotiate between us. I have to convince you that, hey, I need you to do this little extra work that you didn't think you needed to do for the project. Those are some management techniques, even if I am not formally managing you. And then, of course, the leadership piece, because it's not positional, it's standing up and saying, hey, everyone, wait a second. I have an idea, and I want to convince you all of it. So all of these skills are skills that each of us need, no matter where we are in the hierarchy. And even if you never want that leadership or management title, investing in these skills are going to make you more effective as an individual contributor. Yeah. Well, one of the things that I loved uh, in your book that you wrote about was that this idea that people can practice leadership. Uh, and I think you said practice it every day. And uh, this, is, this is a concept that has, I don't know, I don't understand why we don't do more of this. Because at least, at least as Americans, as the average American has played some sport, right? Uh, even as a child, you might have done one year of soccer or, or baseball or something like you. You understand this concept of, we go and we practice. And in fact, with sports, we practice 99% of the time. We only really go and execute in a real competitive situation 1% of the time. Um, you know, even, even our PE in school, it's just practicing. Right? We do all this practice, practice, practice. In school, it's practice, practice, practice before we actually take a test. And yet we come to work and it's, nope, you are on. We are in full game mode and there is no practice anymore. So how do, how do people put this in place? Where, where can they find that good practice so they can be better leaders? There are lots of things you can do to practice your leadership, practice your negotiations, practice these skills. But let's look at a very simple, lightweight one that any company can implement for all their employees. What you want to do is create peer learning groups. Too much of our training is either none at all or, oh, Chris, you're a rising star, so we're going to send you to a two-day seminar you and a few other lucky winners, go do it, come back, now you're ordained as a leader, right? Because in two days, clearly you learned everything. Instead, we want to create these small peer learning groups, and you can create groups as small as six or eight people. There are also ways to scale it to larger groups. What you want to do is have folks read some content together. And yes, you can do it with my book, you can do it with any other book, content online, even listen to great podcasts like this one, and each week, have them listen to that content, get that content, and then together have a discussion about it. Because as much as we want everyone to stand up and lead, you can't always create that circumstance where, okay, Chris, we're giving you a chance to lead now. But what we can do is as we sit around, talk about leadership circumstances, ones from your past, from my past, a circumstance I'm facing right now, and I can get your input on it. And mm -hmm. as we discuss this, this will help us learn and formulate our understanding. This, by the way, is how we teach at MIT, and this is how top business schools teach it. So this is a proven method that companies can implement for effectively little or no money. Right, right, and it's just so important. I mean, we, so we have like very specific meetings that we do like once a month where we practice meeting and we practice disagreeing and we practice, you know, and it's like, it amazes me how if we don't do that every month, we sort of lose a little of that psychological safety. We lose a little bit of that edge, our ability to, to really then, it sort of sets us up for the rest of the month to be able to be really open and honest and have good disagreements, right? To have, have a, you know, uh, you, you don't, I, I, was, I was worried in a meeting if everyone agrees and everyone just thinks what I said was correct. I'm like, oh, there's something going on here. This is not good. Like someone needs to disagree with me uh, in order to feel better about, you know, whatever my idea was. <laughs> You know, so here's how we should think about it. when I teach negotiations, I give the example, imagine you're a 25 year old, you have this job opportunity for $60,000, but because you learned a little about negotiations, you negotiate a thousand dollars more. So you get 61,000. If you do nothing else in your career, you just got a thousand dollars more for the next 40 years That one tiny negotiation. This isn't solving world peace, tiny negotiation. It took five minutes gets you $40,000. And of course, yeah. we know you're not going to sit in that job for 40 years. You'll have promotions, raises, other jobs. Learning to negotiate can add tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to your bottom line. Now, let's think about this generally. With leadership, no one's going to say, you're a better leader. Here's $1,000 more. But it's going to open up opportunities for you. You're going to get better opportunities. You're going to get better jobs, better promotions. All of these skills, if you just get a tiny bit better, 
it adds up, right? You get this massive compounding effect. If in an organization, everyone in your company got 2% better at communicating, what would that do to your bottom line? So it's not about trying to take a few people and make them superstars, just elevating everyone a tiny amount on these skills, which is really easy considering the baseline we're coming from, has a massive ROI on your company's effectiveness. And, and I love the $40,000 example. And I would even argue that there's probably more money uh, and value to you hidden in there because the, the crazy part about the psychology of negotiation is that people want to negotiate. So if you don't settle for that initial offer and you negotiate yourself for something, they feel like the people you're negotiating with feel like they got a better deal because and a, a better employee because you advocated for yourself, you negotiated, and they think, well, that person's going to go do that for me every day inside the company. And I, Whereas if I took the first offer right away, they might go, geez, did I offer too much? Is this person desperate? Did they just, you know, did I hire the right person? And now there's doubt, right? And you can't ever un undo that. Um, so it, 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 that, that psychology is, always fascinates me. And you hit upon a deeper part of this. Sometimes HR will say, wait, wait, I'm teaching my employees to negotiate better. They're all going to ask for more money. Well, yes, but first of all, they're going to get more money from your partners, from your customers, from your suppliers. Mm -hmm. But also the people we negotiate most often with to be our coworkers, And so learning to negotiate better with our coworkers just makes us overall much more effective and creates better outcomes within the organization. Well, Mark, we're uh, almost out of time here. I want to ask two quick questions. Uh, first, is there a book that you're reading right now or, or, or something that you think uh, our listeners should check out? Uh, I just read my friend Charles Vogel's The uh, Story for Leadership, which I and I list a number of fantastic books on my website. Some that I reference, others are just good general resources. Well, that's the second question is how can people find out more about you? What's your website or where should they, they go to find out more? You can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. You can get in touch with me or follow me online. You can download the free companion app for the book, which is available from Apple and Android and linked from the website. There's a whole resources page. Well, Mark, you've been a spectacular guest. Tons more to get to. So deeper and you can get uh, to it. But uh, thank you again. Right back at, after this quick second guest, uh, Steve Oren. Imagine by the news you're reading is six months old. There isn't much. around. It's good to know that People G2 offer yesterday's news approach solution that to the information by industry leading technology people is able to give you accurate delivered quickly to our online system or integrated with your HR system yourself are you comfortable working with old news or are you ready for a different kind of background check company visit peopleg2.com or call 800-630-2880 that's 800-630-2880 or peopleg2.com welcome back to the talent talk radio show don't forget you can connect with us on social media and follow us at on Twitter at PeopleG2 and be a part of the conversation right now if you'd like to follow along with the live tweeting or maybe if you're listening after the fact, you can uh, you can uh, even comment there as well. You can certainly keep track of us at TalentTalkRadio.com or wherever you find our podcasts, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, Spotify. There's a gazillion of them out there. Just pick one and subscribe and then you'll never miss another episode. All right, we're going to go ahead and bring in my second uh, Steve Oren. He is the federal CTO at Intel. Uh, and uh, Steve, welcome to the show today. Thank you. Good to be here, Chris. Why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself, what you do, what's important for us to know about our conversation, uh, you know, about you for our conversation today? Uh, sure. And so, as mentioned, um, I'm the federal CTO or chief technology officer 
for Intel Corporation. And in that role, it's my job to help the federal government understand both today and the future technology and architecture that Intel and its ecosystem brings to bear, as well as take the input from the federal government across civilian, military, and intelligence and its ecosystem back inside Intel so they can better understand the needs, use cases, and requirements, and really help divide, uh, uh, drive solutions and architectures that solve those mission and enterprise style needs. Well, that, that sounds like an amazing opportunity to really do some, some, some cool stuff. I mean, I, I could say that sounds like a really tough job, and I could say that sounds like a, an overwhelming challenge, but I, I think it kind of sounds exciting. I mean, you have ability to impact the lives of hundreds of millions of people, right, by helping the government get it just even just a little bit better, just a little <laughs> bit right, right? <laughs> Absolutely. It is truly, and it, it does cover just about every kind of use case from citizen services to, uh, you know, scale platforms and everything in between. So it, it's never a dull moment. Right. Well, that's, I guess that, that's a good way to work. It's never a dull moment. <laughs> so, you know, what, what really drives you then to, to innovate? You have, you have a lot of probably different stakeholders. You have lots of different initiatives, things that are going on. How do you sort of focus then on, you know, I guess that innovative part? Well, for me, it really comes down to a couple of fundamental things. Uh, for me, what really excites me about innovations is being able to solve problems. Um, and the challenge of being able to tackle those hard problems. And they don't always have to be the big, hairy problems, you know, boil the ocean, big human problems. Sometimes it's the small problems that are just a little bit of innovation provides that efficiency that actually gets things done. Um, and so really it's about coming up with those approaches. And for me, you know, throughout my career, oftentimes it's coming out with those, what they call the outside the box style approaches, coming at the problem from a different angle. Um, and f finding solutions, finding ways of doing things or building new technologies or new approaches um, that ultimately have impact. Like you mentioned, the, the thing that really excites me about this job and about my previous roles is about being able to impact on the market or impact on people's lives. When you make the IRS more efficient, that means taxes get returned faster. When you make the, you know, the Department of uh, Transportation better, it means bridges get built better. So everything gets better if you can help them solve their big enterprise and mission challenges. And it goes across all aspects of government. Um, and then the other key thing is that what you can do for the government, which is sometimes a vanguard of the broader industry, what works for them will be needed by other industries. They have a lot of the other industries, whether it be regulated industries like financial services or healthcare or industrial, have many of the same use cases and can leverage those innovations that we build for government to really sp uh, spawn new capabilities out